We want to welcome those of you who will be with us here at Word of Life Ministries this morning on Facebook and those who will be viewing. We'd much rather you be here in the flesh, and if you can be, we ask you to, to come and see if this would be where the Lord would have you to, to be a part of His body in the earth, uh, because church is not just about a meeting place, it's, it's an organism. It's a, it's a living representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we welcome you. We're glad you're with us in this service. There's no distance or time in the Spirit. You can, you can be ministering to the Lord together with us and receiving from His Holy Spirit, whether you're in our state or another state or another nation. And uh, we just want you to know we're glad you're with us. Let us know if you watch and if you're blessed by, by these messages. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you remember what we have been looking at the last few Sundays? Anybody? What is it? Do I need to go back and start on page one? The work of the church or the ministry of the body. The ministry of the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We saw that over in Ephesians, and I won't go back and preach the whole series again. But we saw that Ephesians, Paul recorded under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is the head. We are the church, are the body. Now, you know, that should show us a little bit there, give us a little bit of understanding about the unity that we have with him. You can't separate the body from the head and the body live, can you? You ever heard of a guillotine? You know the enemy tries to get you in the guillotine every day? He wants to separate you from the head of the church. He's doing his best in these days. He is doing his best in these days to separate people from the church. Somebody say amen to that. It's all around us. He uses he uses every weapon that he that's at his disposal to try to to try to keep people from coming together and minister to the Lord together. And uh, we need to be aware of his devices. And, and you know, as much as, as, as we like putting our, our messages out because there are people who are homebound and there are people in other states that like to be a part of our services, it is no replacement for fellow for coming together in person. It is no replacement. And you can't truly fulfill your role in the body of Christ if you're not hooked up with a local body. So I say that as an encouragement to those here as well as to those who are watching us online. We need one another. And uh, you can slough that off if you want to, but it'll be to your own, to your own problems in the future and your own dismay. Uh, Brother Frank, you said something this morning that jumped out at me. He said, we have to be faithful. Somebody has to be faithful. You know, faithfulness is one of the fruit of the Spirit. If I don't watch, I'm going to get off in another vein. But faithfulness is one of the fruits of the Spirit. And, and, and if we don't see that, it's because we're not walking in step with the Spirit. Now, you know, there are people, there, there are legitimate reasons. People, people have to work and people, you know, sometimes they're out of town and so forth. But I'm talking about generally speaking. Amen? Faithfulness is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a fruit of walking in step with the Spirit. And, and, and uh, we can see, as we've been looking at the ministry of the body, the last point that we made was how that Jesus understood how much we, the church, was going to need Holy Spirit to do the work that he'd called us to do. That he, You see, he gives us instruction, but in order for us to fulfill the instruction he gives, we need power. That's why he said in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. What for? To be my witnesses, to be my body, to be able to do what I'm asking you to do. That's what he was saying there. It's not just so we get glory bumps, goose bumps, and a good feeling, and, and, and people shake and quake. You know, I don't make fun of those things, but sometimes we focus in on those things rather than that personal relationship that is so much more important than any feeling. Thank God for those holy goose bumps. I enjoy them as much as you do. Thank God for the manifestations of the glory of God. I enjoy those physical manifestations of the glory of God. 
They're, they're wonderful. But you know he's here whether I see him with my natural eye or whether I feel something or whether, whether the wind blows in the building or not. I know Holy Spirit is here. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus made several statements that let us know just how much the body, the church, needs the Holy Spirit. And this is where we left off. I gave you several verses. I won't go back over all of them. But I'm so glad he gave what he said what he said is recorded in John 7, 37. Because there are people who would say, well, yeah, well, you receive Holy Spirit at salvation. You do have the presence of the Holy Spirit in you at salvation. Jesus described that to the woman of the well as, as a spring bubbling up into you that you never thirst again. And personally, for your own personal well-being, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit at salvation. But there is an, a, there is a, an experience subsequent to salvation. We know it is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus spoke of it in John chapter 7, verse 37, where it said, in verse 38, he said, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said. Well, let me go back up. In the last day, verse 37, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried and said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And out of his belly, he that believeth on me, as the Scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost had not yet been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus here is talking about an experience subsequent to salvation. We're going to see that in, in some of the uh, other scriptures that we bring out. But he said, out of their bellies shall flow rivers. You see the distinction between a river flowing out of you and a spring bubbling up inside of you. There, there's a difference. There's a difference. One quenches your thirst. The other goes out to touch others. That's why we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit so desperately. We, and, and, and we saw uh, we saw the fulfillment of what Jesus told them to tarry in Jerusalem for in Acts chapter 2 where we looked at the day of Pentecost. Then I told you we're going to look at what several of the other heroes of faith said about this. We see Peter also knew how much the body would need Holy Spirit. And if you want to hear more about what Jesus had to say about it and how Jesus depended wholeheartedly on the Holy Spirit. Go back and, and, and look at the notes from last week or go back and view from last week. Jesus depended totally on Holy Spirit. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Our key scripture when Jesus read from the book of the prophet Isaiah and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me too. And then he gave his mission statement. This mission statement could not be possible, it could not be fulfilled were the Spirit of the Lord not upon him. We need Holy Spirit. We need Holy Spirit's anointing. We as the body of Christ, you me, all of God's children, need Holy Spirit's anointing. Hallelujah. And we don't want to limit it, do we? Peter knew how much the body would need Holy Spirit, the body of Christ. In Acts chapter 2, and verse 38, this is at the day of Pentecost. Peter stood up and he began to address the people who had gathered because a huge crowd had gathered. People were in Jerusalem by the thousands at that time, they, they, they come back to, their, to, to, to Jerusalem. It was, it was Jewish custom. They needed to be there. Jewish people from all over who, who spoke languages from all over. If I don't watch them, we'll get on another rabbit trail. And they'd all, they, they, these 120 people were in the upper room. And, and they received the baptism and it said they were prophesying and speaking in other tongues. And, and, and the people who gathered around heard them, but they heard them in the language of the nation where they'd come from. And they understood them to, to be saying, talking about the greatness of God and the great works of God, bringing God glory. You know, I've heard people say things like, oh, you better watch, you're going to get a devil. I've never heard a devil yet glorifying God. Amen. 
Peter makes this statement as he's addressing, and, and in this address, you remember there was about 2,000 people who came to accept Jesus that day. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. There you see salvation. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, this is a subsequent, this is an experience subsequent to salvation. We see it when Philip went down to Samaria. It, 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 now I have seen people who were saved and filled almost simultaneously. But this is subsequent to salvation. What prepares you for the new wine is being reborn in Christ like a new wine bottle. Amen. Glory to God. And you shall receive the gift of, whole, of the Holy Ghost. For the promise, this promise is unto you. Now notice what Peter said here. Because there are people who will say this ended with the apostles. This ended with those original disciples of Christ, the, the early church. This is all in the past. This was just for the early stages. Well, it's funny, Jesus never said that. Paul never said that. Peter never said that. John never said that. The Holy Ghost never said that. I'll tell you who said it. The devil said that. Because he wants to shut people down from the power. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. Verse 39. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as our Lord God shall call. This is not just for us, it's for generations to come. And it's not just for the generations that are our descendants, but it's for those out there who hear the message and, want, and will receive. If they hear God, if they hear the message, remember what Paul said to the Romans? He said, how shall they hear without a preacher? And you know, the sad thing about today's church now, thank God for the church that is hungering and thirsting after God and pressing into him. And there is a, there is a body, there is a group within the, 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 the people we know as the church, the, the church here on earth, who are pressing in and want more. They're, they are coming like Jesus described there in John 7. They're thirsty and they're drinking. He will not hold our nose and pour it down our throat. We have to drink. We have to drink. We have to participate. Amen. It's not like giving your kid a, a, a little child medicine. You know, I can remember a few times when ours didn't want medicine and they needed it. I just pinched their nose. It sounds mean, but I had to get it in them. Sooner or later, they had to open their mouth to breathe. And when they did, I was ready with a spoon. Now swallow that. Amen. Sounds like cruelty, doesn't it? But no, it was love. But you know, God won't do that with the things of the Spirit. He won't force. But he'll say, if you're thirsty, come on and drink. If you're thirsty, come on and drink. And, and, and when you do, things are going to happen. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 14, here we see another place where Peter was involved. This is where Philip has gone down to Samaria. And if you go and you read the account, the reason Philip was there in the first place was kind of what Brother Lawrence was talking about earlier, the, the, the persecution of the church. The church had scattered. The church is coming under persecution today like we've not seen in this land. You know, this nation was established upon godly principles by men of godly character. And I know that there are people today who are trying to pick, pick apart our forefathers, and I'm not saying they were perfect. And I, I, I dare say nobody under the, the, the sound of my voice, whether here or on, on the Internet, is perfect. I imagine if we got a magnifying glass out and started examining one another, we could find some flaws. Do you agree? You can do that with anyone. But I, if you go back and you read the writings of our forefathers in this nation, you find men who were seeking God's face for the direction of this land. 
they would not begin to even consider removing the laws of God from public places. They wouldn't even consider such a thing. They would call that blasphemy and would have probably run anyone on, out of town on a rail who even, who even mentioned such things. Our forefathers, you read some of their writings, and, and you know, you, there are many who are trying to rewrite history. Don't pay attention to that mess. I tell you, someone who's good to go to is David Barton. You can go online. He has a, he has a, a site called Wall Builders, and it, it gives you wonderful, wonder. and he has one of the largest collections of, 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 of uh, uh, books, writings, memorabilia, uh, of of our country's past which show the Christian heritage that we have. I'm telling you, these people that are trying to rewrite history, it, it, it's, it, it just galls me. It is demonic. It is a, they are endeavoring to take God away from our nation and it's not going to happen. You and I are not going to let that happen, are we? Now, Philip has gone down to Samaria and he has preached the gospel and these people have believed. They have believed the word that he's taught and signs and wonders are happening. People are being healed and set free and, and, and born again. They are accepting Jesus as their Lord. G, uh, Philip is preaching the good news, the gospel to them. The good news, that's what gospel means, the good news. You don't have to go to hell, hallelujah. The Messiah has come. He paid the price. And these people are, they're, they're, there's great joy, the word says. There was great joy in the city. We pick up at verse 14. And when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they'd received it, that they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them. Now notice, notice the importance that they put on this. They weren't praying for them for salvation. They had already received the word. They had already believed. They were already walking in the joy of the Lord. But there was something that they had not yet received subsequent to salvation that the early church saw it important enough that they sent Peter and John down to make sure that they got it. To make sure that they had the opportunity to receive. Notice what it says here. When they were come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For he had not yet fallen upon, for he had, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were, had been baptized, they had identified with Christ, but they had not yet been received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. They received. They received. Matter of fact, look over there, because I didn't print it all out. Look over there in your Bibles if you have your Bible with you. Acts chapter 8. We want to see something here. Because this is Hallelujah. Now, I decided when I started into this teaching, the series, that I wasn't going to rush it. Now, I told you I might, I might take a break and give Miss Edie, because, you know, every, every so often she'll ask me, how many more Sundays do you think you have? How many more Sundays do you think you have? I've got to give her the pulpit every now and then, because I've got to live with her. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> no, 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 no. When it's in you, it's burning. It's got to come out. Yeah. <laughs> Don't dig that hole any deeper, huh? Acts 8, 17. <laughs> I want you to see something here because there are people who use this and say, look, it doesn't say they prayed in tongues. Well, look at verse 18. Now, Simon, he, he's this guy who has believed he was a sorcerer. He was used, he was, he was, used to using demonstrations to sway people. 
And this was a man who was in, he had been in contact with the spirit world. He was not just a magician, though he may have used tricks as well. But he was known as a great power in that area. Then he heard about Jesus. He heard about, now this, he's a, at this point, he has already believed. Look over here at verse, let's back up to verse 7. Let's back up to verse 5. Then Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now, we're not going, we're not going to rush through this. We're going to take our time with it. We want to get all the good. We're going to be like that old cow chewing her cud. We want to get all the good out of it we can. Now, when you get home, you, you, you're getting it the first time here, at least for this week. When you go home, you pull this up and chew it some more. Amen. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people were with one accord. Notice what it says. And they gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. This is something we need to be believing God for in our church and in today's church. We, we need the demonstration, the power of the Holy Ghost. We need God's demonstration of his power. And he will receive the glory here. For unclean spirits crying with loud voices came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man named called Simon which before time in the same t city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. Now he had them deceived, didn't he? And to him they had, re had regard because that for a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself, get this now, then Simon himself believed also and he was baptized. This is a man who had been a sorcerer. Don't say it's too late for somebody. It's not too late for somebody. If, if, they, if they have any sensitivity whatsoever to the wooing of Holy Spirit, it's not too late for them. A person who has committed the unpardonable sin, number one, you can't do that if you haven't been born again. You can't do that if you haven't walked with God, if you haven't tasted of the things of the Spirit and, re and, and invested the Word into your life. If you, if you look at what is referred to as the unpardonable sin, I believe it's in Hebrews 6. There are, there are four or five different criteria that you have to have in your life before you can even sin that sin. And when you sin the unpardonable sin, you have turned your back on, on the goodness of God that you have tasted and been lived in. You turn your back willfully against God. And when you do this, uh, uh, Brother Kenneth E. Hagin, matter of fact, I think I have a copy right here. In this book, The Triumphant Church, he gives a, he gives a testimony, an example in, in this book uh, uh, of, of uh, a pastor's wife, how that God gave him a vision and showed him how this transpired in her life. It began with a thought, and as she meditated on it, first she didn't receive it, and as she meditated on it, it became a, a black spot in her mind. And eventually, as she kept pondering and meditating on it, it dropped down into her spirit. And the end result was, was that she turned her, totally turned her back on God. And when, when a minister, when God sent a minister to her to try to restore her, she looked him right in the eye and said, to hell with Christ Jesus. And the Lord showed this to Brother Hagin and said, this is the unpardonable sin. She had tasted of the good things of God. But through a lie, through deception, Satan had crept into her life. And she led him in by believing the lie. And, and to, when she, at the end result was, she no longer had any sensitivity whatsoever to the wooing of Holy Spirit. At that point, that person has no hope. 
They have no hope. But a baby Christian can't send this sin. An unbeliever can't send this sin. Amen. Hallelujah. Something we need to understand. So we see that there was hope for Simon. This guy was a sorcerer. He dabbled in the occult. Do you know if you have if you have someone living beside you and they've been involved in witchcraft, there's hope for them to be saved. They just need to be exposed to the gospel and the power of God. Because Simon saw something that was life changing. He saw people's lives being changed by the power of God, by the spoken word and the, the manifest glory of God. He saw people being set free and he wanted to be part of it. So he believed, he was baptized, and he continued with Philip, wondering and beholding the miracles. You know, he thought that he, he was something big. If you read, remember back a few verses back, said he held himself up to the people as something, something to be admired. But he was admiring here the power of God and the, the, the working of the word of God. Verse 14, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For he had not yet fallen, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Now again, there are people who say, well, it doesn't say they spoke in tongues, so we, tongue, you don't have to speak in tongues. You don't have to speak in tongues. You get to speak in tongues. Quit looking at it from the wrong side. You get to speak in tongues. But it doesn't spell it out here that it says, but notice verse 18. Now this is Simon, a baby Christian who's used to seeing signs. It says, when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Now Simon's a baby Christian. His mind has not been renewed to the word yet. He's still thinking the way a sorcerer would think about buying tricks, buying potions. Do you hear me? You can't expect a baby Christian to think like a mature Christian. A lot of people have become frustrated. And let me say this. I've watched so many people come through the doors of the church and think that going to the altar and praying the prayer of salvation is all they have to do to make it to heaven. Well, if they died right then or Jesus came right then, they probably, if they seriously meant it, they'd go to heaven. But you can't come and just pray a prayer and then go back and live your life the way you want to and expect to please God. At some point, you are going to walk away. Now, you and I can't be the judge of a person's spirit. But honestly, if a person doesn't, doesn't make some changes, and a big responsibility here falls on the church. In today's church, there's very little discipling going on. We have to take part in one another's lives, help one another grow. Amen. Well, I'm getting off track here. So Simon saw, what did he see? What did he, he saw something. Well, more than likely, though it doesn't spell it out, in every other case, it said they saw and heard them speaking in other tongues. So more than likely, that's he saw something that let him know, hey, they're not just happy. They'd already had joy. They'd already said there was great joy in the city. He saw something. And he wanted it. He wanted it so bad he offered Peter and John money for it. And, and notice here, Peter didn't cut him any slack. He said, he said uh, in verse 19, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. And Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that this gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness, of thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in a gall of bitterness and in the bond of, of iniquity. 
Those were soulish things. You know, he had been dethroned as the, the spiritual bigwig in the area through this. And I'm sure Simon was dealing with some resentment even though he was seeing and had tasted of the, the goodness of the gospel of God. Do you still have a soul after you're born again? Does it have to be renewed? Yes. Spirit man is made new instantly, but the soul has to be restored or renewed. And we're going to see that later on in his teaching. Then answered Simon, now here's his heart. You see, up to uh, Simon had been speaking from his emotions, his em and, and he got slapped on the wrist by Peter. Then Simon backs up, pulls his emotions, pulls, pulls the soulish back, and, he, and, and, and this comes out of his spirit. Notice what he says here. Then, si then answered Simon and said, Pray the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Simon repented. Amen. So we can see here that don't think that it's too late for someone. This man was a sorcerer. And, 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 and uh, he received the word of God and was born again. Hallelujah. Peter, so Peter understood. He, they made a special trip from Jerusalem down into Samaria to bring to these people this gift of God that we know is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, was it simply because, th did they have to lay their hands on them? You're going to see later on in Acts chapter 10. Uh, matter of fact, let's look over there. Acts chapter 10. Hallelujah. I didn't put this in your notes, but it's good anyhow. Praise the Lord forever. Hallelujah. At Cornelius' house. Verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that had feared God for all his house, with all his house, which gave all, much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, of the angel of God coming into him and said unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon the tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee that, that what thou oughtest to do. Do you know, God, the angels won't preach the gospel for us. The angel couldn't give Cornelius the gospel. That's the job of the church. So he told him, send for Peter. Now, long story short, Peter being, being Jewish, it was, it was not considered right for him to go into Cornelius' house. It was against Jewish tradition and law because he was non-Jew. And, and many, of the, many of the Jewish people believed that, that, that the church, they didn't understand the church at this point. They were beginning to get some understanding. But that the things of God were only for the Jewish people. But God was bringing, especially through Paul, that this was not just for the Jewish people, but all who would believe. So Peter is on, on the housetop of this, this, this man's home, and, and that's where he has the vision of the sheet let down from heaven three times, and the Lord telling him, and on the sheets all the different animals, creeping and crawling, different things that are considered by the Jewish people as unclean. I could stop there and talk about some of this stuff that raises up ever so often about diets, People trying to go back to the Old Testament diets. You know what the Lord said? He said, bless it and eat it. Amen. Amen. He calls it doctrines of devils. Amen. He calls it doctrines of devils. People saying you can't eat this and you can't eat that. 
I know people go back to, and, and there are some things that just make common sense to the, to, to, you understand you eat too much of anything, it's not good. You can kill yourself with, 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 with sunflower seeds if you want to. Amen. How come me to get off on that? I don't know. But that, that, you can't live new covenant truth by Old Testament law. That was foreshadowing something that was coming. So Peter's on the housetop. The Lord lets down the, net, the, 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 the sheet that has all the different animals on it. And three different times he said, take and eat. And Peter said, oh, no, I'm a good Jew. Thank God for the Jewish people. Everybody say, thank God for the Jewish people. Amen. And the Lord said, call that not unclean. What I have said is clean. Three different times this happened. Why did the Lord do that? Because he talks to us where we can understand it. He speaks to us in ways that we can comprehend and understand. And after the third time, immediately, there was, a, there was somebody at the gate, and they said, well, these, these guys from Cornelius' house. Well, Cornelius, and immediately Peter understood what the Lord was trying to tell him to go to Cornelius' house because before that he would have called Cornelius unclean and would have had no part with him. So Peter goes to Cornelius' house. And, 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 and he begins to tell them about the truth. Let's pick up over here in verse 24. And the, and the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together all his kinsmen and near friends. Do you think he was a little bit excited? Cornelius didn't just say, I'm going to get the good here. He said he called together his relatives, his kinsmen. He called together his friends. He wanted everybody who could to get, on, get in on this good thing that God said is coming. If you come unto me and drink, you remember Jesus said. If you come unto me and drink. How many of you used to ever watch the Western? You ever remember on the cattle drive when they're driving the cattle across a long, dusty area, been dry and they're having trouble finding a water hole? And now all of a sudden, the cows out front, they start to get restless and pick up the pace and the old cowboy. If you watch many of the old westerns, the new westerns, they don't talk about this kind of stuff because they just take it for granted. You're, you just don't, there's no way you'd even know what they're saying. Some of these new things that just aggravate the, the tar out of me when, when they, they show somebody trying to chop a tree, to show one of these actors trying to chop a tree down, he doesn't even know how to hold an axe. I was watching one yesterday. I tried to watch a western yesterday, and the old boy was chopping a tree. I got so aggravated with him chopping that tree, I just turned it off. He was holding, he was holding the axe. I, well, anyway. And the cows out front, all of a sudden, they get restless, and they start running. And the old cowboy looks over at the other one, and he says, they smell water. They smell water. That's how we ought to be about the things of the Spirit. When you thirst after the things of the Spirit, you're drawn to it. And when you get there, you don't just say, look at that water. That looks good. I bet that'd quench my thirst. No. You wade off in the middle of it. You drop face down in it and just start sucking in all you can get. Doesn't matter if somebody's standing over there saying, oh, you better watch out. You might get something you don't want. No, you're getting water. You're getting what you, you're getting what you need. You're getting that life power. Mm. I hear a rumbling on the horizon. Yes, the darkness is around. And the darkness is as dark as it's ever been. But this glory, this glory is as that water. And if his people will simply come, will simply come and drink. Oh, the power of God and the manifest, manifestation of his power will be seen and he will be glorified in this day. In this day. Cornelius had gathered He'd gathered his, his friend, 
his friends and his family, his kinsmen, his near friends. And as Peter was and as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him and said, Stand up, I myself am a man. This is the kind of spirit we have to have. If God uses you, no matter how greatly, you don't accept the praises of men. It's one thing that I appreciate so much about, about Brother Marilla. Some mighty things are happening in his meetings, but every time, I don't think I've ever watched one of his meetings where he didn't say, don't you look to me, this is Jesus. That's one of the things that any of the mighty, any time a, a person begins to accept credit or receive praise, now there's a difference between receiving praise and saying thank you when somebody gives you a compliment for something. But when you begin to receive the praises and you begin to thank yourself more highly than you ought, like this is coming from you, just remember, you couldn't do a thing without the Holy Spirit. Try it on your own sometime. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Peter said, I'm just a man like you. Don't worship me. Hmm. Be cautious about people bragging on you about how good you can pray, how good you can preach, how good you can do this or you can do that. Make sure that you keep a humble attitude. And let me tell you something else. The key to praying with the anointing is seeing yourself talking to God, not talking before people. The key to praying with anointing is your, that your focus in prayer, if you're with a group of people, your focus is, I'm talking to God. He's listening to me and I'm conveying my heart to Him. Not how good I sound to the people. Man, I must really sound powerful. Boy, I bet that one really sounded good. I bet that impressed everybody around me. That, that does not bring glory to God. That brings glory to me. And that sickens God. Amen. You say, God doesn't get sick. You know what I mean. Jesus himself said to the lukewarm church, he'll spew out of his mouth, vomit. Some translations literally say vomit out of his mouth. Amen. Y'all still with me? Y'all don't mind if I take my time a little bit and ever so often meander on these things the Holy Spirit brings up, do you? Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 27, and he talked with him and he went in found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful, an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company, or come unto one of another nation, but God hath showed me. Notice here, see I wasn't just saying that because I assumed it. The Bible says, Peter said this, God showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. How did he show him that? With, with the sheep and the animals. Now, Peter was, he, he, he had the understanding, though God used animals, he had, had the understanding to realize God was using that to show him about men, people. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying as soon as I was sent for. I ask therefore, for what intent you have sent for me? Here's another key. You don't, you don't just go marching, blabbing, and grabbing. He said, what intent do you, did you call for me? Why do you want me here? And Cornelius said four days ago, he, he told him what happened. Let's jump down to verse 34. Let me clarify something I just said. You don't, you don't just go in and start trying, trying to force feed the gospel. If there's not a hunger there, if there's not a desire there, 
they will not receive it. There has to be a hunger. And you have to know in your heart. Listen to the voice of the Spirit. Listen to that inward unction. You may be able to plant a small seed that will grow into something big. But if you try to force feed the whole load, you might mess up the whole thing. We must be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. There will be times that the Holy Spirit will tell you, don't go there, don't preach there. Keep your mouth shut. I can give you scripture and verse for that. And I'm going to if we get to it today. That's right. Chapter 16 of Acts. But notice here it says, Immediately therefore I sent unto, uh, verse 34, And Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was established throughout all Judea and began from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth of the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all the things that he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Peter's just going through and explaining who Jesus was what Jesus did, what Jesus accomplished to these people who had gathered at Cornelius' house. And he commanded us to preach unto people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through, that through his name, now notice something here. He, he gets to the part where this is the way you're saved. He, ta he told them who Jesus was. He told them where he came from. He told them what, his job, what, his, what he was here to accomplish. And then he gets to the part is of this is how you receive the benefit of what Jesus did. And when he said this, these guys that were gathered at Cornelius' house, you've heard me say you've got to have your, your pump primed. Their pump was primed. They were ready to receive. They were those thirsty people that Jesus spoke of in John 7. Because when Peter got to this point, and he said here in verse 43, To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And when he got to the place here, showing them how to be born again, they received salvation, and this is one of those cases where it was almost immediate. We're going, we've seen one, we'll see others where it wasn't immediate. But these, these guys were ready. They didn't just want a little bit of God. They wanted all of God, all that they could get. And notice what it says here. When, when Peter said, When Peter said that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins, notice verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as we all did? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. They wanted to be taught. 
They wanted to be taught. They were still babes and they needed to grow. They received the message that Jesus saves and, and, and instantly, instantly received. Upon, being, upon receiving the truth, they instantly received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this, the, 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 uh, J- Peter didn't go by himself. There were Jewish men, leaders who were with him, and this was a sign to them. You remember, Peter gets called on the carpet up in Jerusalem later on for, for going to Cornelius' house. Because there were people who were upset because this was supposed to be just a Jewish experience. But God had other plans. Thank God. Because I'm not Jewish. Thank God for the Jewish people. Thank God for Abraham. That's why the Jewish people are blessed. Because of Abraham. And, and that's why I'm blessed. And you're blessed because of Abraham. He made covenant with God. And through, through Abraham's lineage came Jesus. And, and Jesus is now our Savior and our Redeemer. Though in the natural flesh I'm not Jewish, on the, in my spirit, man, I have God's DNA. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord forever. So they received. And those, those Jewish uh, 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 believers who came with Peter, it said they were astonished. You know what? It will amaze you sometimes just who God, just who, who, who receives the things of God. Don't you know that there were people who were astonished when Simon the sorcerer received the gospel and the truth and was born again? What, what do we need to do? We don't need to be selective with our own natural understanding. We need to follow the Holy Ghost. Because he might, he, he, he might use you to bring somebody to Christ that you would have thought in your own mind could never be saved. Glory to God forever. Hallelujah to God forever. Many churches, I started to say this a moment ago and got sidetracked. Sometimes I, 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 I make my own exit ramp. But many and much in the church world today has turned their back on these things. Many and I thank God for, for the church, all the church that believes Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. That's the true church. They're church. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. But in the name of reaching the masses, now hear what I'm about to say. In the name of reaching the masses, they have trimmed away much of the things of the Spirit. We're not helping the furtherance of the gospel or people experiencing the liberty we find in Christ Jesus when we begin to carve out what God said we need. And there are many who start off on the right foot but because it's beyond the intellectual because it's, it's, it's not something that, that we can control or understand with our thoughts and, and our own understanding. People put the brakes on. I've seen, there's one major denomination right now that I'm thinking of. Most of the denominations that we know of, and I'm not anti-denominational. Thank God for the denominations who are preaching Christ. But many, many denominations, and many who, who call themselves non-denominational, are putting, are putting the brakes on the manifestations of the glory of God because society has gotten too intellectual for those things. You know what? That's what you call being too smart for your own good. Smarty britches. Amen. When you're too intellectual, I want you to know the smartest person you know up beside God is pretty stupid. Amen. And he'll use the foolish things to confound the wise. Oh, hallelujah. My goodness, where has our time gone? Paul. You have time for one more? Paul knew how much the body would need the Holy Spirit. In Acts 19 and verse 1, in his travels, now this is some 
If I'm not mistaken, this is about 20 years after Pentecost. And it came to pass that while Paulus was in Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Notice, uh, there, there, later on you see that it was about 12 disciples, 12 men that Paul came across here. And they believed. He said, have you, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? So they were believers. Paul already was, he had already identified that they were believers. Paul understood the, the need that we have as the body of Christ for Holy Spirit. Not just the experience of salvation. He's the one that baptizes us into the body. But he understood the need that we have for the baptism of Holy Spirit. He understood the, the need we have for the power of God which we can move in when we, have, when we receive this wondrous gift. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost? And they said, we don't even know, we, we never even heard such a thing. Verse 15, who when they were come down, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I, I have jumped on the wrong one. Verse Three, and he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. John's baptism was a baptism unto repentance. It was not the water baptism we know now. The baptism of John the Baptist was saying, I recognize I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. The baptism we have now, the water baptism we have now says, I recognize I was a sinner. And I was counted as dying with Christ and being raised together with him. Now I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Do you see the difference? One says, I see the need for my salvation. The other says, I have been saved. I have been raised a new man. So they'd been baptized in the water baptism of John the Baptist. Then Paul said to them, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which would come after him, that is Christ Jesus. Then they, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. So Paul understood. And my goodness, if you read the writings of Paul, all through his writings, he talks about how much we need Holy Spirit and his anointing. Mm -hmm. We could go on. We're going to pick up here next Sunday. Glory to God. And we're going to take our time, unless Miss Edie speaks. I know she's getting the itch to, to preach again. But uh, th this is... Th th this is I'm under a mandate of the Holy Spirit to take our time with this because we need this. The church needs this. Oh, my goodness. Stand together with me if you would. Lord, I pray right now that these, your words, would reach everyone that they need to reach. I thank you, Father, that your anointing rests upon your word. And I thank you for your anointing that rests upon me. And I come to you humbly, Father God. I pray that anything that I may have said today that was of myself, that it blow away as chaff in the wind. But, Father, anything that you said that I said by your spirit that would set men's hearts free, I pray, Father, that you take them, these words, and use them. And I thank you that the power that has been spoken as we look to your word goes forth into the eternities and lives are changed. We thank you now, Father, and we give you praise and honor and glory. And we thank you for the awesome gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, first of all, for salvation. We thank you, Jesus, that you paid the price for our sins. 
We thank you, Father, that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that, that when we came and believed, you baptized us into the body of Christ. And we receive the spirit of, of adoption whereby we cry from our hearts, Abba, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood. The blood that washes away sin doesn't just cover it, but that spotless blood. For you are our great high priest. And you were, you, you, you were tempted in every way, yet without sin. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for baptism in the Holy Spirit that now, Lord Jesus, we can be about your works where truly you, through your church, can be manifest in this earth. Anoint us, Father. Anoint these, your people. Thank you for that anointing. We want to be the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Lord Jesus, we want you to never never be restricted through our disobedience. But we want you to always be able to depend on us to do what you call us and tell us to do. So we humble ourselves before you now. In Jesus' mighty name, we glorify you and we praise you. Amen and amen and amen. If you're out there viewing this and you've, if you've never been born again, it's, it's not hard. You just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. He's the Son of God. He paid the price. And with your heart, from your heart to say, I receive you as my Savior, Lord Jesus. I repent of my sins. He didn't make it hard. Then there's an experience subsequent known as a baptism. And you can receive it right there. Just like Cornelius' house. You heard these words this morning. You can receive. Right there where you are. And by faith step out and receive what he's given you. Paul, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, this is for those who would believe. It's not for a select few. It's for all who will believe. We're so glad you were in this service with us. God bless you until next time. Walk in the Spirit. Be doers of the Word, not hearers only. We'll see you next time. Hallelujah.